Good day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Today we have with us Dr. Colleen McClung, who is an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. Dr. McClung's work focuses on the molecular biology of mood disorders and drug addiction. She has been involved in this field for many years and has been awarded numerous awards and grants. She and her team are committed to understanding the molecular mechanisms that underlie diseases like bipolar disorder, drug addiction, and major depression with the hopes of developing better treatments in the future. Nearly all people suffering from psychiatric disorders have significant disruptions in circadian rhythms and the sleep-wake cycle. In fact, disrupted sleep patterns are one of the major diagnostic criteria for these disorders listed in the DSM-5. There are several human genetic studies that have identified specific polymorphisms in circadian genes that associate with a range of psychiatric conditions. Furthermore, environmental disruptions to circadian rhythms, including shift work, travel across time zones, and irregular social schedules can precipitate or exacerbate mood-related episodes or put individuals at risk for substance abuse. Recent studies have found that molecular clocks are located throughout the brain and body where they participate in the regulation of most physiological processes, including those thought to be involved in mood and reward regulation. Today, Dr. McClung will summarize recent clinical and basic research findings from her group and others. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. McClung, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk about this work um, and uh, tell you a little bit about rhythms and why they're important and how we think they um, can be uh, manipulated perhaps to, to be therapeutic um, for a number of diseases, including bipolar disorder. Uh, so just sort of a review of circadian rhythms. So um, basically, the word circadian means about a day, and uh, we, um, everyone, every organism, all uh, people, plants, animals, uh, living on planet Earth, uh, we all have this 24-hour day that we revolve around, and essentially every process in the body has a 24-hour cycle. So um, there are different times of day where we have the best uh, coordination. Um, greatest cardiovascular activity, uh, highest uh, body temperature, um, even changes in bowel movements, things like that, revolve around this 24-hour cycle. And of course, the main thing people usually think about with circadian rhythms is the sleep-wake cycle. So we um, are typically awake during the day and sleep during the night. And uh, all of these uh, processes, um, because they revolve around this 24-hour cycle, it's really important to uh, to know when um, when to do certain things, when not to do certain things, and, and how disruptions to the system might lead to problems. So we know a lot about how these um, rhythms are regulated. So um, from, from many, many different studies and a number of, of organisms, we found that light um, input comes through um, specific cells in the eyes, in the retina. Um, they contain a, a specific protein called melanopsin. And these uh, cells will um, send that signal to an area of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN. And the SCN is kind of like the master uh, pacemaker of the brain and of the body. Um, and so it sends signals um, either through projections, direct projections, or um, through um, hormonal signal, signals out to the rest of the brain, the rest of the body, and acts sort of as the conductor of the orchestra of all these different rhythms in, in virtually every cell in the body. And that's sort of illustrated here in, um, in this slide where um, things, uh, light is the main influence into the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, and it can synchronize all of these different clocks. Uh, but also things, other things that we're exposed to on a daily basis like food, uh, social interaction, um, some uh, kinds of medications or drugs of abuse um, can also synchronize these rhythms or desynchronize these rhythms and, um, and influence how our body reacts to, um, to environmental stimuli. So um, the basic molecular clock that's present in, in nearly every single cell 
is um, it consists of this um, this very elegant uh, transcriptional translational feedback loop. So basically, this feedback between um, changes in gene expression that occur over a 24-hour cycle. And I'm not going to get into too many details about this. I just put sort of a simplified circadian clock up here where uh, these two proteins, the BMAL1 and clock proteins, will bind to each other and they um, will bind to the, these sequences in certain genes called EVOX sequences and that controls the expression of these genes and it controls the expression of a whole lot of genes. But um, two of them that are the most important are called the period genes and the cryptochrome genes. And once these become proteins, they can dimerize and they're, um, they're changed by a number of factors and they will inhibit the activity of clock and BMAL1. So this forms, again, this really nice uh, transcriptional translational feedback loop that regulates all the rhythms in, in every single cell in the body. And the major proteins here I really want to emphasize, I'm going to talk about some of our work with clock. So remember clock is this, um, this transcriptional activator here. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about this protein casein kinase 1, which modifies the, um, the period in cryptochromes a little bit later. So um, our rhythms can be disrupted in a number of ways. And so this is a picture that illustrates um, light pollution throughout the world. You can see in the United States here at night, we have um, quite a bit of, of light pollution. Um, and obviously, this is something quite new to, to our species. Humans didn't have artificial light through most of evolution. So, um, so this can really disrupt our, our circadian rhythms if we have light exposure at night when, um, when we're, we're not accustomed to that. Um, other things like shift work, um, obviously, can be very, very disruptive to rhythms if people are working during the night and uh, sleeping during the day particularly if shifts are, um, are not consistent. If you know one day there's a day shift, one day there's a night shift, this can really wreak havoc with the system. Um, travel across time zones, again, this is something pretty new to us, is the ability to, to jump on a plane and travel across the ocean. Uh, so um, you, know, you often feel the effects of jet lag, which can last several days after traveling. Um, people now have very inconsistent sleep-wake cycles and social schedules. Um, you know, this, this really wasn't the case, um, you know, even 100 years ago. Um, also, there's some sort of um, more natural things that happen with rhythms. So during puberty, uh, rhythms change. So um, kids, when they're growing up, they, um, they have pretty regular sleep-wake cycles where they, they like to wake up in the morning and go to bed in the in the evening. Um, and as they become teenagers, they uh, suddenly want to wake up at noon and go to bed at 2 a.m. And this is a normal part of adolescence that happens um, uh, to almost everybody. And there's actually a concerted effort now to try to change school start times um, because it's not really in line with how teenagers are or how their body clock is working. And it really can, um, can be detrimental to them. And then with aging also, um, rhythms sort of shift the other way where people um, will, as they become older and older, will wake up earlier and go to bed earlier. And um, so, uh, so there's just natural changes that occur to rhythms over, over the lifespan. Uh, genetics also plays a, a role. So people are sort of morning people or night people. And this is, is, um, is a genetic um, trait that, uh, that's passed down in families. Uh, and of course, blindness um, can affect the way that light um, can be um, can signal to the circadian clock. So disruptions to circadian rhythms can cause a whole bunch of problems. Um, one of them, of course, is jet lag um, or shift worker syndrome. That's pretty obvious um, if you have this sort of uh, disruption of the system. Um, it can also increase the risk for cancer. So this is um, a really um, growing field right now with the realization that um, uh, shift work was actually labeled recently as a cause of cancer by the Amer American Cancer Society. Uh, it can lead to, sh to sleep problems, um, chronic insomnia, or there are actually some circadian sleep disorders um, based on how early or how late 
uh, you want to go to sleep and want to wake up. Uh, disruptions to rhythms will increase the risk for metabolic disorders, obesity, diabetes. Again, these are um, there's a number of studies that show that if your clock is dysregulated, um, that um, that there's a higher risk for these types of metabolic conditions. Um, our lab obviously is is very interested in how changes to circadian rhythms are involved in mood regulation and can precipitate mood-related episodes in uh, the context of bipolar disorder. Um, we also know this can increase the vulnerability for addiction and relapse following, following abstinence. Uh, there's also a growing field that shows that circadian rhythm disruption can be very um, detrimental when you have neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Um, Drinking at all different times of the day will lead to a greater uh, increase in liver disease um, versus drinking at the same time of day. And, uh, and also we know that disruptions to circadian rhythms will, um, will really change uh, memory processes, cognitive ability, ability to pay attention, all of these things. So, um, so I hope you get the sense that uh, circadian rhythm disruptions are not good for you. They're, they're pretty bad for a lot of different reasons. And when we talk about disruptions to circadian rhythms, there's, um, there's actually three different ways in which these rhythms can be changed. So you can either have a change in the phase of the rhythm, which is where um, your rhythm will peak at a different time of day than um, when it normally peaks. Um, you know, so this is a change in phase. You can have a change in period, so either a longer rhythm or a shorter rhythm. And you can have a change in the amplitude, which is the strength of the rhythm. So how robust is the rhythm? Um, this would be a change in the amplitude. So when I'm talking about rhythm changes, this is what I'm really talking about. So um, we know that people with mood disorders have very disrupted uh, circadian clocks. Um, this has been shown in, in numerous studies over the years. Um, if you take people who have bipolar disorder, and measure their rhythms in a number of factors like um, body temperature or hormonal rhythms, like melatonin rhythms, uh, look at their sleep-wake rhythms. Um, compared to healthy controls, uh, the rhythms are very, um, very highly disorganized and disrupted. Uh, we know that changes in schedule um, can precipitate manic episodes. I'll show you that data in a minute. Um, depression is diurnal, so um, usually the worst depression symptoms are in the morning and they typically get better through the day. Um, this time of year, seasonal depression is very common, um, particularly here in places like I live in Pittsburgh and we have very cold weather and dark, uh, a lot of darkness. And uh, seasonal depression is actually the um, most common mood disorder. Um, and depression occurs more frequently in areas of the world where there's little daylight for long periods of time, like Alaska. We also know people with the preference towards eveningness, so people who are night owls naturally versus people who are, are morning larks um, are more susceptible to depression and, uh, and the vast majority of people with bipolar disorder are evening types. Um, and uh, like similar to what I was talking about with adolescents. Uh, and now there have been a number of um, polymorphisms or mutations that have been identified in genes that control circadian rhythms that associate with these um, mood disorders. Uh, so many uh, human genetic studies have now identified some of these mutations um, that link specifically with these diseases. So there's a lot of evidence that this uh, system is really involved in, um, in the development and progression of mood disorders. We also know that, um, that in the course of bipolar disorder, that mood states are often seasonal. And so um, it's, uh, it's more common for mania or hypomania to be present in the spring and the summer months. And more, press, more um, often depression is in the fall and the winter months. Um, and this is, is quite a common seasonal pattern. It doesn't happen with everybody, but, um, but it's something that's seen quite often, which again, implicate some, something with the circadian system in this uh, disorder. Um, I'm going to show you uh, just one example of, um, of the, activity uh, the activity records of somebody who um, 
has bipolar disorder compared to somebody who, um, who does not. So this, um, these activity records were taken with um, uh, like a wristwatch device similar to a Fitbit or something like that. It's an, it's a, um, an actigraph and, um, or actigraphy watch. And it just records um, activity over the day and, and during the night. As you can see in this healthy control, um, there's activity that occurs during the day and then they're mostly inactive at night. And that's compared to someone who is manic, where they have um, lots of activity that uh, really has no pattern over the, um, the day-night cycle. And uh, they may crash into a phase where they sleep for pretty much a day and then go right back at it. So um, this is just an example of how disruptive these rhythms can be in somebody with, uh, with bipolar disorder. And you can even see these disruptions at the level of, of cells. So this was a study where um, they took skin cells from, um, from people with bipolar disorder and cultured them in a dish and then looked at rhythms and gene expression um, compared to, um, to healthy controls. And what they found is that the people who had um, bipolar disorder um, even in their skin cells you could tell that their rhythms were dampened. They had less amplitude in um, a number of um, genes and the expression of a number of genes um, compared to healthy control. So this is really a, a phenomenon you can see even at the level of skin cells. And there are some indications too of changes in um, period length in people with um, bipolar disorder. So this was a very old study um, done um, in 1978 where they took um, uh, five subjects and um, measured their free running rhythms, which means that they had to put these people into constant conditions, um, constant darkness for a long period of time. And this is why this study was done so long ago. You can't do these studies anymore. But um, what they found was that um, the people who um, had, that of the five subjects, um, there were um, people who had um, fast rhythms that were too fast, basically. And that when these people took lithium, then their rhythms were slowed down. And then they had two subjects whose rhythms seemed very slow. And when they took, rhythm, took lithium, the lithium had no effect on their rhythms. And it, these people happened to be the ones that were non-responders to lithium. So this suggests that this um, change in the rhythmicity that occurred in response to lithium was really key to the therapeutic success uh, for these particular people. And as I mentioned before, we know that, um, that changes to schedule, changes to, um, to in rhythms can precipitate episodes. So um, this was, um, was demonstrated in this particular study where um, they asked a group of people who were either manic or depressed um, what was happening in the period um, before they had this particular episode? You know, was there some event in their life that was stressful? Were there events in their life that, that maybe really disrupted their sleep-wake cycle? And what they found was that um, in this pre-onset period um, that the majority of people who were manic, almost 70%, 65 to 70% of them, had some kind of, of sleep-disrupting event that happened that's, that might have led to this um, precipitation of, um, of their manic episode. Um, and this didn't really seem to be the case as much with depression, uh, which is interesting. So it, it seems that really manic episodes in particular um, can be brought on by these changes to the sleep-wake cycle. Um, another kind of interesting um, report uh, that I came across in the literature is um, one that shows that, um, that the state of bipolar disorder can actually be um, changed if people fly in one direction or the other. So this was a, um, a study where in a two-year period, they had 186 patients that were admitted from um, straight from London's Heathrow Airport to um, the nearest psychiatric hospital. And when they looked at where those people had been flying who um, came into Heathrow Airport, 
they found that um, more often the people who were flying from east to west um, had depression. And the people who were flying the opposite direction were more likely to have mania. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting study because uh, it suggests that, um, that changing your clock, either sort of advancing your clock or delaying your clock, might have opposite effects on, on mood state for people who have, um, who have bipolar disorder or um, in some of these patients it was also schizophrenia. Uh, so again, interesting in the sense that circadian rhythm changes are really involved in, in how um, mood is being shaped in the brain. So these sorts of studies led to um, a theory that was developed in, um, in the late 80s uh, called the social Zeitgeber theory. And Zeitgeber is just a fancy word for, um, it means time giver in German. It's something that um, will uh, set the circadian clock. And uh, what Ellers, Frank, and Kupfer um, theorized is that um, in the case of bipolar disorder, that there's an abnormality of the circadian pacemaker, so something genetic that is um, maybe makes the circadian clock a little more susceptible to, um, to being thrown out of, out of whack, um, something that makes the clock more fragile, some sort of, of genetic factor. And then what you have are um, life events that um, lead to changes in, um, in your sleep-wake cycle, changes in rhythms, and, um, and then this leads to rhythm disruption in, in your uh, schedule. And then uh, this, in turn, leads to a biological rhythm disruption and other symptoms, which then lead to affective episodes. Uh, so basically, they're suggesting that, you know, the combination of both this sort of genetic vulnerability and um, the change in, um, in schedule that's precipitated through so something environmental is what really can um, lead to these uh, episodes, particularly manic episodes. And so they developed this um, therapy based on this uh, called interpersonal and social rhythm therapy. And what they do with um, this particular therapy, it's very similar to, um, to traditional psychotherapy, except that it involves this social rhythm metric, which um, basically uh, people keep a very, um, a very carefully, um, uh, careful diary of, of when they get out of bed, when they have their first contact with another person, when they do their first um, activity, whether it be work, school, family care, etc., when they go to dinner and when they go to bed. And um, the idea is that if people can really stabilize their uh, circadian rhythms um, just through this sort of, um, of tracking of their day, then um, this might help to prevent those mood episodes from happening. And when they looked at, at this therapy compared to traditional psychotherapy uh, for bipolar patients, what they found is that um, they, uh, when they looked at occupational functioning, so on this particular scale, um, a lower score actually means better occupational functioning. So these people, if, if you have a lower score, it means you're, you're doing better, you're, you're um, just generally your life skills are, are much, uh, much more functional. And so they found that when they did this, um, this therapy, at the end of the acute treatment, uh, they had a really big effect on um, the occupational functioning and a much stronger effect than you see with just uh, traditional psychotherapy. Now, if you look out at one year or two years, uh, eventually traditional psychotherapy catches up, but um, a good case can be made that, um, that this sort of interpersonal social rhythm therapy can really be be much quicker at, at helping people with um, uh, sort of making the most out of their lives and having the most, uh, most functional outcomes. And it turns out that most of the treatments that we have for depression and bipolar disorder really affect the circadian clock. Uh, so I talked about social rhythm therapy. Another treatment that's used um, in the case of depression is total sleep deprivation, which may seem a little counterintuitive, but um, when somebody comes into the ER and they're acutely suicidal or, or very depressed, 
um, what you can do is um, put them through one night of total sleep deprivation and this will actually be very antidepressant for about 50% of people um, for the short term. So it's just long enough to get them then into some other um, kind of treatment. Uh, unfortunately, once they go to sleep again, it, it no longer works. But, um, but it's thought to sort of reset the circadian clock um, by having this one night of, of sleep deprivation. We also know that bright light therapy is very effective for seasonal um, depression and also for some unipolar depression. Uh, so bright light therapy is actually shown in this picture. Um, you sit in front of a box or um, some other kind of light device, and it's usually the blue spectrum of light that's the best. And, um, and this has to be done in the morning, and this will um, sort of advance circadian rhythms, so um, bringing the circadian rhythms back to where, uh, to be more in line with, um, with the, the start of the day. Uh, now, I have to say, um, bright light therapy is not always good for people with bipolar disorder because it can switch them into mania. Uh, so it, it should be very carefully used in that case. But for seasonal depression, for, um, for unipolar depression, bright light therapy is actually quite good uh, with very little side effect. Uh, there's a, there are some drugs now that um, target the melatonin system. So melatonin is a hormone that is uh, re released at night by the pineal gland. It helps to um, control the timing of sleep. Uh, it won't put you to sleep, but it helps to facilitate sleep. And um, melatonin on its own is not so antidepressant, but there is a, um, a medication called agamelatin, which has been approved in most of the world, but not in the United States, um, which targets the melatonin receptors and is actually um, a pretty, um, pretty good antidepressant. And then we know that drugs that um, have been used for years, like lithium um, and SSRIs like Prozac, um, and other um, serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors uh, also influence the circadian clock uh, quite dramatically. And I'll show you a little bit of that um, later on. So how does the circadian system influence mood reward? So this is really what our lab wanted to know. We, um, we're a very basic research lab, a very molecular lab. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of studies that we can't do in humans uh, to try to figure this out. So we, um, we chose to work on um, another organism, which are mice, and mice have very nice circadian rhythms, very robust rhythms, and, uh, and so they're a nice system for us to, to try to explore some of the mechanisms of, of how these rhythms contribute to uh, mood regulation. So we decided we wanted to, um, to look at mice that had a disruption to one of the core circadian genes. And so we decided to look at the uh, clock mutant mice. So these are mice that have a mutation in that clock protein that I mentioned earlier, one of the core features of the circadian clock. And as you can see, when you look at normal mice, um, when they're running on a wheel, you can track their activity. And you can see normal mice have these very nice patterns of activity over multiple days where they have black is where they're active and white is when they're not. Uh, compared to the clock mutant that just have highly disrupted uh, circadian rhythms. Uh, so these were mice that we, we thought, why don't we look at these mice and see if they have any features that look similar to um, people with depression or people with um, bipolar disorder. And obviously we can't uh, ask the mouse how it feels um, if it's anxious or depressed. Unfortunately, I wish we could. Um, so we have to, to kind of assess this in another way. So we use a number of different assays to, um, to try to determine um, sort of the mood state of the mouse and, and if it likes something or not and these kinds of things. So this is just a, um, uh, some of the tests that we use. Um, so we use things like the forced swim test where we put the mouse in a bucket of water and, um, and they've struggled to get out of the bucket of water. And if you give the mouse an antidepressant like Prozac, they'll struggle for longer to try to, give, to, try to get out before they sort of give up. Uh, we never let the mouse drown. Uh, but this is a, sort of a measure of behavioral despair or, or their, um, their depression-like uh, qualities. We also look at things like sucrose preference, so how much a mouse prefers to, to drink uh, sugar water versus regular water. 
And uh, this, is, this is tapping into this thought of anhedonia, where um, people who have depression um, tend to not find things that are normally rewarding quite as rewarding. So if a mouse prefers sucrose less, then this suggests that they are sort of in this anhedonic state. Then we look at things like open field elevated plasmase to look at anxiety. So mice are um, put into a situation that is normally very anxiety provoking, like the middle of an open field where they could get eaten by something, or um, this raised platform of an elevated plus maze, and where they could obviously fall off versus the closed arms. And we look at how much time they spend in these anxiety provoking areas versus the non-anxiety provoking areas. And then we look at things like condition place preference and self-administration where we can actually see how much a mouse will take drugs, um, like drugs of abuse like cocaine or alcohol or, um, or what have you. Um, or we can um, look at uh, if we pair a drug with one side of a box versus saline on another side of the box um, or food or anything else rewarding. Uh, we can ask then, where does the mouse want to hang out? Or do they want to hang out where they got the drug or where they got the saline? So um, these are just kind of a, examples of some of the assays that we use in the lab to try to figure out if a mouse, how a mouse feels or what a mouse likes, uh, these kinds of things. They're not perfect, but you know we do the best we can. So when we use these kinds of tests, we found that um, the mice um, with the clock mutation look very similar to people who have bipolar disorder, specifically in the manic state. So the mice are very hyperactive. Um, they sleep less than um, wild type mice. They have less depression-like behavior in the, um, the assays that I mentioned. Um, they have lower levels of anxiety, so they're sort of greater risk takers. They'll, they'll just run right out in the middle of an open field where normally a mouse, if they did that, would not, it wouldn't be very good for them. Um, and they're more sensitive to the rewarding effects of pretty much everything. So cocaine, sugar, brain stimulation, um, anything like this, that um, alcohol, anything we give them, these mice really, really love it. Um, and of course, people with um, bipolar disorder, specifically in the manic state, are more prone to addiction. Um, so uh, all in all, these mice look very similar um, to bipolar um, subjects, but specifically in this manic state. And if we give them uh, medications like lithium or valproic acid, which is uh, the same as Depakote, um, this reverses these phenotypes and brings them back to look more like uh, wild type mice. And so this is really a complete and very, um, you know, very interesting model that we can use then going forward to try to figure out um, how bipolar disorder may develop, how the circadian system is involved in this, and what sort of treatments might be, might be good for reversing these effects. Recently, <clears throat> we also found that these mice um, really cycle every day through um, through two different states. So they basically, um, during the day, uh, when mice, mice are nocturnal, so they're usually sleeping during the day, um, that's when these guys really become manic, is, is, is when they're supposed to be inactive. And then um, at night, when mice are normally in their active phase, these guys look pretty much normal. So on a bunch of these different tests that I mentioned, like the open field, the forced swim test, the sucrose preference test, um, when you look into the day and the night in uh, wild type mice, just control mice, you see that there's really not much difference in their behavior. But when you look at the clock mutant mice, you can see that they have this precipitation of this manic state that happens. But then they pretty much go back to normal uh, during the night. So essentially every day these mice are, are cycling through this um, period of mania and period of sort of euthymic or normal um, state. And uh, this is really exciting to us because for the first time we have a mouse that uh, will spontaneously change mood states uh, throughout the light-dark cycle. So we wanted to know what was causing this, you know, what was really behind this. And so we decided to focus on um, a region of the brain uh, called the ventral tegmental area or VTA which contains a lot of the dopamine neurons. So 
dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's involved in um, lots of things, but particularly it's involved in arousal, um, sort of activity, uh, and reward, and also mood. So it's, it's a very um, important molecule in the brain uh, that has been implicated previously in bipolar disorder. And so um, we really wanted to know if there was a change in, in dopamine cell activity in these mice that might underlie some of these abnormal behaviors. And indeed, when we recorded from these cells that contain dopamine, what we found is that the clock mutant mice have too much firing of these cells. So they're, they're, the cells are really um, sort of hyperactively firing. So there, there's just too much dopamine. And when we gave them lithium, this reversed this back uh, to that of normal mice. So lithium is able to sort of quiet these cells and make the mice uh, more like normal mice. Uh, so this suggested that these dopamine neurons are really important in this behavioral phenotype. So I'm not going to go through a lot of our other data. Um, we have lots of papers, if you want to look them up, on, on sort of how clock might be mediating the system. But I'm just going to give you a summary of, of a lot of these studies. So um, essentially, when we looked at dopamine cell firing at different times of day, we found that, um, that similar to their behavior, the clock mutant mice seem to have way too much dopamine at the wrong time of day. So the time of day when they're supposed to be sleeping, instead they're getting these surges of dopamine, uh, which is, um, is, seems to be leading to their, um, this appearance of this manic-like behavior. And if we, if we try to mimic this um, during the night, we basically see no effect. So there's really something specific about there being um, a surge of dopamine at the wrong time of day that is leading to these effects. And this might um, be uh, related to the fact that circadian rhythm disruptions are really precipitating manic episodes. So um, if you have a disruption to your circadian system, it could be leading to these surges of dopamine at the wrong time of day when your brain's not really, really prepared to handle it so well. And in certain people, this could lead to a manic episode. Um, we've also done a number of studies to try to figure out how this is happening. So we found that um, the clock protein is involved in the regulation of um, dopamine synthesis, so um, the production of dopamine in the brain. And this um, is disrupted in the mutant mice. So um, basically, they have too much dopamine production, um, again, at a time of day when they normally don't have it. Uh, and this may underlie some of these effects. Um, we also know that while clock expression in these dopamine neurons seems to be really key, we've done a number of studies to, to really pinpoint what clock is doing in the dopamine neurons. Um, clock is also widely expressed throughout the brain, throughout the body, um, and we also know um, from some of our studies that, um, that circadian rhythm disruption in the SCN, for example, is also really important in the control of mood. So it's not just clock in, in dopamine neurons, it's not just the surge of dopamine, but rhythm disruption in other brain regions can also, um, can also really lead to, to differences in mood. And, um, and in fact, when we expose mice to a chronic stress paradigm, um, and then we look at the development of a depression-like state after they've been you know, exposed to weeks and weeks and weeks of, of these chronic stressors, what we find is that um, when you look at, at how disrupted their circadian rhythms are, this directly correlates with how strong their depression is. So, Essentially, the more disrupted their rhythms become, the more depressed these mice get. So, um, so this is sort of a summary of a lot of the studies that we've, we've done in the lab uh, recently in regards to, to how clock and rhythms are involved in mood regulation. Um, so I want to get into treatments. So, um, so can we treat bipolar disorder or other mood disorders by strengthening the circadian system? Obviously, I showed you that um, something like social rhythm therapy can, um, can really be beneficial. But um, what about a pharmacological approach, something, you know, testing a medication? 
And it turns out that two of the most common medications that we use already for bipolar disorder, lithium and uh, valproic acid or Depakote, um, they increase circadian rhythm amplitude. So this is again studies from, um, from skin cells where um, they take samples of skin cells and culture them in a dish and then look at, at how the rhythms are, are um, going along in these cells. And when you put lithium on these cells, you can see that there's an increase in the strength of these uh, rhythms. And the same thing with valproic acid, you see, you give it here, there's this increase in, um, in the rhythm amplitude. So already we know these two drugs um, that are quite commonly used in the clinic um, will increase circadian rhythms. And what's, what's exciting is that circadian rhythm um, modulating drugs are really being developed by a, a lot of pharmaceutical companies now. And um, one that just became FDA approved is this drug, um, Ketlios, which is a melatonin receptor agonist. Um, again, remember melatonin is a circadianly regulated hormone that, uh, that helps to modulate sleep. And this drug has recently been um, FDA approved for the treatment of what's called non-24 disorder in blind people. So uh, non-24, um, because people, um, certain blind types of blindness um, will cut off the ability of light to um, signal to the SCN, what happens is um, humans have a slightly longer period internally than 24 hours. So if you were all put into constant darkness, you're rhythms would run longer than 24 hours typically. And that's shown here. So here's a synchronized person where um, here they're sleeping during the night and they're awake during the day. Um, and a desynchronized person where um, essentially they're not getting that light input and so their rhythms are, are running long. Um, and what this, uh, this particular drug can do is it will synchronize those rhythms and make them more uh, like the person here. Um, on the left. And so, um, so this is exciting. Even though this is a drug for blindness, it's, um, it, or for blind people to use, it, um, it's exciting that the FDA is now um, approving drugs that have a purely circadian mechanism for um, therapeutic treatment. So one of the drugs that we have tested on our mice um, is a, a drug that was developed by Pfizer which um, inhibits uh, this protein called casein kinase 1. And um, what this uh, casein kinase 1 inhibitor does is it also increases rhythm amplitude, um, as you can see in panel A. And when you give it to mice that have disrupted circadian rhythms, either by genetics or through constant light, it will synchronize those rhythms really, really nicely. Uh, it also can decrease relapse like drinking in, um, in an, uh, a rat alcohol model. Um, if you give the drug, you'll see decreases in drinking. So um, this is also sort of a positive effect of this drug. So what we found is that when we give this drug to the clock mutant mice, um, it works uh, almost just as well as lithium. Um, at really changing the, um, the anxiety and depression-like behaviors of the mice to bring them more like normal mice um, compared to uh, the vehicle alone. So this is an example of a drug that um, someday could, or a drug like this, could someday be used in um, the treatment of a mood disorder or some other um, disease which involves rhythm desynchronization. I also um, mentioned that valproate um, or Depakote will also uh, work therapeutically in the clock mutant mice, so it brings them back towards um, the behaviors of, of wild type mice. So um, the last study I wanted to mention is one where we're taking the approach of, of trying to take a, an, an already existing drug and look at the mechanism of how this drug might be working and then developing a much more selective agent um, based on, uh, on what we know it, by, by sort of teasing apart what's really the important of act action of that drug. So the, um, the problem with some of the therapies that are already out there are that they have a lot of side effects, a lot of off-target effects, and um, they're not really, they, they can be very harmful in the long term. 
So one of the mechanisms by which um, valproate works, is thought to work, is through the inhibition of these proteins called HDACs. Um, and the problem again is that it inhibits a lot of these proteins and these proteins are involved in gene expression. So um, by sort of teasing apart um, which of these HDACs might be the important ones, then we can locate, okay, aha, we only need to inhibit maybe these HDACs and not all of the ones that uh, valproate targets. So we chose to do this by um, looking at a drug called Saha, which has um, been FDA approved for the treatment of cancer. And Saha is just as effective in our clock meat and mice at um, reversing their behaviors. And so now we look at, okay, which proteins are, sh have a shared inhibition by valproate and Saha. And this brings us to this uh, group of, of proteins right in the middle. And then by further teasing apart with more specific drugs, we can get to, down to only one class of HDAC. So here, one drug, MS275, works, but another drug, MC1568, does not. And even further, when we go to a genetic approach where we can knock down just one of these proteins and see a therapeutic effect. So here we've knocked down HDAC2 and we still see the therapeutic effect. Then we know, okay, maybe if we only target this one protein, that this is going to be um, just as therapeutic as, as the drug which targets all of them and should have much less side effects. Uh, so this is another way our lab is trying to use the mice that we have to develop novel treatments. So just uh, quickly in conclusion, um, the clock mutant mice we found are excellent tools for the screening of novel compounds for mood regulation, better understanding of how FDA approved drugs are functioning, and learning about the molecular and cellular mechanisms that lead to bipolar disorder and uh, the vulnerability for addiction. And in terms of circadian rhythms, um, we know that um, mood stabilizing compounds increase rhythm amplitude. As I showed you, rhythms are, are clearly disrupted in um, people with uh, diseases like bipolar disorder and that if you can, if you can really uh, stabilize these rhythms, it might be therapeutic. Um, we also know that antidepressants generally lead to a phase advance in rhythms and I didn't really talk about that as much, but this is another way that we could really, besides just strengthening the rhythms, we can also change the phase of the rhythms, uh, which might be therapeutic, um, similar to bright light therapy. And uh, novel compounds are being developed that alter rhythms in particular ways um, for the treatments of many diseases, including uh, bipolar disorder. So with that, I'll thank the people in my lab currently and some of the past members that um, contributed to the work that we do and our funding. And this is our beautiful city of Pittsburgh in, uh, in the summertime. So uh, thanks, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, um, Colleen. I do have a couple of questions to get started here. First one is, and I know that you had talked a bit about um, melatonin, but are there any other herbal medication suggestions for chronic insomnia? Um, melatonin is really the only one that works um, through the circadian clock. Now, there's a lot of other medications that might make you drowsy or, you know, be sort of um, sleep enhancing. Uh, but in terms of uh, trying to work through a circadian mechanism, melatonin is really, um, really the only one. It's, um, you know, the other thing about um, insomnia is um, the light exposure around is very, very important. Sort of sleep hygiene is very important. So going to bed only, like, at the same time every night, being in the dark, not looking at an iPad or an iPhone or something like that, um, and really only using the bed for pretty much sleeping. And uh, these things all seem to really help insomnia. Um, but melatonin is, is generally pretty safe and it can be effective for a lot of people. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one that's used really widely. Excellent, thank you for that answer. The next question, um, let's see, what is the effect on your sleep cycle 
and exercise, especially in the evening for people with bipolar disorder? Yeah, so exercise is really, um, you know, shown in from several studies to be really beneficial for um, for all mood disorders. Um, in terms of the time of day of exercise, um, it's you know I don't know if there have been a lot of studies that have really looked at whether it's better to exercise in the morning or better to exercise in the evening. Probably most physicians would say if you're getting any exercise, that's better than no exercise. Um, yeah, I can imagine how for certain people exercise in the later evening might sort of keep them awake longer. Um, but you know there haven't been a lot of studies that have looked specifically at at whether it's it's better to do it in the morning or the evening. Probably, as I said, most physicians would say if you can get in any exercise at all, that's it's better than nothing. Great, thank you. Let's see. This person, Catherine, um, is very much enjoyed your webinar and thanks you very much. Um, she's interested in the aspect of sleep deprivation used for severely depressed, unresponsive, and suicidal patients. So during, mm -hmm. during my most recent depressed episode as a BMD sufferer, I went without sleep for one night entirely to insomnia after sleeping too much during the day. This really shifted my chemicals and he started coming out of the depression. I am thinking of trying a melatonin product which synchronizes rhythms in the future. Um, any suggestions? Um, yeah, so sleep deprivation is really, like I mentioned, it's primarily used in, um, in emergency rooms to try to, to acutely get someone out of that really depressed state. Um, it does work in about 50% of people, um, but it only lasts as long as, um, you know, until the person goes back to sleep. Um, I would say, I, I, again, melatonin is a, a very safe drug. It really hasn't, in clinical studies, it hasn't been proven to be too effective at, on its own as an antidepressant. Um, I wouldn't expect it alone to be... Um, to be very therapeutic in terms of, bi especially in terms of bipolar disorder or major depression. For seasonal depression, um, the studies are a little bit more promising where melatonin may be um, taken in the evening, again, about an hour before bedtime, um, might be more therapeutic for seasonal depression. Um, but uh, in terms of bipolar, um, you know, something more along the lines of social rhythm therapy with um, more conventional medications might be uh, might be more therapeutic. Great, thank you. I know, um, Dr. McClung, that you don't like to or don't want to get into the area of dosage, but um, in terms of melatonin, which is a natural supplement, um, mm -hmm. is there a recommendation? Uh, generally, people take between um, you know, one to five milligrams. Um, there are um, some studies that suggest you should sort of ramp up on it a little, like so start with a very, very low dosage, you know, less than one milligram and sort of gradually increase up to um, maybe three to five. It just, but it really varies by individual. You don't, for some people, melatonin makes them groggy and uh, in the morning, and so you don't want to take so much where you feel like that. Um, so, I, you know, obviously it's going to be dependent on how much people weigh or, um, you know, what your, your sort of body chemistry is like. But, um, but, you know, I think most of the supplements that are sold in the stores are sort of between one to three milligrams. Um, and that seems to be the typical dose. Excellent. Thank you. Um, what concern should there be for medications that are heavily sedating, such as quetiapine, and in my case, led to 13 plus hours per day sleep and during daylight hours. Wow, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously, if you're uh, sleeping that much, you're missing out on most of your life. So it's, uh, you know, not good in that perspective. But also, uh, yeah, too much sleep um, is, can be just as bad as not sleeping enough. Uh, so uh, I, I would cut back on the dosage if possible. I mean, obviously everybody should talk to their doctor about what dosage of medication to take, but it seems like if it's causing that much, um, 
drowsiness, then you should talk to your doctor about maybe changing the dosage on that. Great, thank you. Um, is there, can you please address Seroquel versus Depakote? I'm not sure if this is an area yeah. that you've discussed, but. Yeah, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm more of a basic researcher, um, and so I don't really want to comment too much on um, specific medications and which ones might be better for certain people versus other medications. So I apologize, but I really, yeah, that's not, I, I think that's something, again, people should discuss with their physicians about which one is, is going to be best for them. Excellent. Um, on to the next question. Let's see. Oh, I could do that. That's easy. Okay, I could do that. I appreciate the confirmation of the effect of light on the circadian rhythm. It has been something people still find surprising. Okay, I could actually do that really quickly. Uh, my animal, yeah. my background is in animal behavior, so the concept of hibernation was never a new one. Just a comment. Oh, okay. Yeah, you should have everything. Yeah, light is, you know, light is quite powerful at, um, you know, in terms of resetting circadian rhythms. So, uh, you know, there was actually a study done um, at a hospital where uh, people, they looked at people who were put um, on the east side of a hospital versus people put on the west side of a hospital. So people who got morning light um, versus, you know, not versus evening light. And the people who got morning light actually seemed to recover better. Uh, people who, this was in a psychiatric hospital, um, and faster uh, than people who didn't get the morning light. So even just that amount of light on um, in uh, in the morning can be uh, can really have beneficial effects. So light is very important um, in terms of, uh, and it can really be powerful in terms of how it affects your circadian system, particularly light in the early morning. Uh, it could be very beneficial to a lot of people. Like I said, with bright light therapy, you have to be a little careful with people with, bi with bipolar disorder because it can switch people into mania, but, um, but natural light is not going to do that. So, yeah, it's always, that's always good, morning light. Great, thank you. Can you speak um, more on the effect of changing okay. sleep cycles and the changing light of day? So somewhere along the lines of what you were just discussing. Um, so in terms of changing, um, I, I guess that I, in terms of how um, changing, if your if your sleep cycles are different from day to day, what are they? What's the impact of that? Or maybe is there more to the question? There isn't more to the question, um, Susan. Maybe you can expand on that, and I will ask okay. that again. Um, I'll move on to another. Okay. Let's see. Okay, in your opinion, can three or more days of almost complete rest in low light be a quick fix um, for someone who has not been sleeping? Um, it can be a quick fix. Well, um, it might be, you know, it, it might be beneficial in terms of mood. So, um, you know, there have been some studies with, um, with people who are in mania, um, where they've had dark therapy, so the, sort of the opposite of bright light therapy, you know, where they are put into, you know, a really dimly lit um, room for, um, for a while. And that does seem to be somewhat therapeutic um, for people uh, in hel helping to decrease that manic episode a lot faster. Um, it may, you know, obviously there's, there's two um, components of sleep. There's... Um, you know, there's the circadian rhythm in sleep, and then there's also the homeostatic sleep drive. So um, if you've had a lot of sleep disrupt disruption, you've got both things going on. So there's, um, there's not just, you know, the need to get your rhythms back in line, but there's also the need to catch up kind of on the sleep that's been lost. Um, and sleep in itself really does have a lot of uh, important properties. So there was a study recently that showed that during sleep, your brain is actually sort of flushed with, um, with sort of cerebral spinal fluid, um, and this tends to get rid of toxins that build up in the brain. And so, um, and, and it's also sleep is very important for the consolidation of memory. 
um, so to, to uh, remember certain things in a better way. Uh, so, you know, both of those processes um, really uh, require sleep. And so, um, you know, in terms of a quick fix, it might help, you know, to, to reset your rhythms. Um, but, you know, if you have chronic sleep deprivation, it's going to take a toll and there's really, um, you know, it, it's going to take a while to recover from that. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, next question, are there any studies that you're familiar with that adjust lithium throughout the year based on seasonal symptoms? Um, yeah, I, there have been a few studies on that. Um, I don't know the d details offhand, but there are some people who take lithium almost seasonally. Um, uh, again, this is something you'd want to talk to your doctor about and see if, if that would be the right course of action. Um, uh, but there are people who, who tend to only get manic episodes in, um, in the springtime or summertime, and so that might be a better course of action for them. But it's, yeah, it's something that, that you definitely would want to talk to a doctor about. You should never just stop a medication um, without consulting your doctor. Great, thank you. Um, the next question: um, In any type, and in these types of rhythms, the circadian rhythms, if they're so important, how do people living in parts of the world that operate where days and or nights are extremely extended at certain times of the year? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. So people who live in places like Alaska and um, and in uh, Scandinavian countries, you know, they have some of the highest rates of um, depression and alcoholism um, of, of any, um, anybody. And, um, and so, uh, you know, obviously there are some, some really strong detrimental effects um, that are seen. I know um, a lot of people who live there, they try very hard to stay on a very strict sleep-wake schedule, um, regardless of what it's like outside. So, um, uh, for example, my sister lived in Finland for a year, and she really found that it, that during the winter, especially when it was just dark all the time, she really had to force herself to 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 make her schedule very very regular. And if you can do that, then that um, you know that will keep your rhythms in a very stable pattern. Um, there, it's interesting too if you um, some of the populations that have lived there for generations, some of the native people. Um, from uh, really uh, uh, northernmost parts of the world, um, some of their circadian rhythms have adapted uh, to this kind of lifestyle. And, I, and the Arctic animals certainly um, have very different rhythms um, than animals that are found um, in other parts of the world. And uh, some of them even only have rhythms um, in uh, spring and summer months and then essentially have no rhythms in the winter months. So, um, so yeah, nature has found a way to adapt um, to those sorts of rhythms, and um, and then people try the best they can uh, to adapt to it. If they're if they're not from a native population that has had time um, to to have these sorts of adaptations, then I think people just try to do the best they can. And certain people obviously are more vulnerable to it than others, um, but uh, but yeah, it definitely the uh, um, it's a challenge for people who live in those areas. Great, thank you. The next question, in studies where you refer to persons having bipolar disorder, do these include those with bipolar two? Would separating bipolar one and two be considered? There seem to be significant differences in many areas. Is circadian rhythms one of those areas? Yeah, you know, bipolar 2 on its own is on, uh, honestly just not been studied as much. Um, a lot of the studies are just bipolar 1. Um, some studies include both bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Um, but a uh, majority of the studies, I think, are, are focused more on bipolar 1 just because it's, a, um, it's generally uh, sort of a more severe um, state than for bipolar 2. Um, but a lot of a lot of studies also kind of lump it together. Unfortunately, um, you know, when it comes to doing human work, uh, it, you know, it's it's often difficult to get just the population that um, that you want to get, and to get enough 
um, people signed up um, that meet certain criteria and so a lot of times studies just have to kind of take what they can get and um, and so it's not always the best design um, but uh, yeah so it kind of varies from study to study but I would say most have been focused m primarily on bipolar one but I would I would imagine that it's sort of similar um, bipolar two may not be as severe Excellent, thank you. Next question, um, first a comment, an excellent, excellent uh, talk. And her question is, um, are you familiar with the long-term effects on the body from chronic insomnia? Yeah, um, well, I, there, you know, now it's becoming apparent that there's really a lot of, um, a lot of effects. And it, you know, it, it really depends on the individual as well. So there are, you know, certain people need um, less sleep than other people because of the quality of sleep. So, um, you know, there's certain people who, who just naturally have very um, sort of strong consolidation of sleep and so they don't need as many hours of sleep. And so those people can function fine on, you know, maybe four or five hours of sleep a night, whereas other people really need a good eight hours of sleep a night to really, um, you know, function optimally. Uh, so it's sort of varies from individual to individual, but, um, but generally um, there's, um, you know, as people get older, especially there's sort of more cognitive problems, there's more metabolic problems. Sleep, sleep loss has really been strongly associated in a lot of um, studies lately with um, obesity and diabetes. Um, um, when people aren't sleeping as well, they tend to crave uh, carbohydrates and um, maybe more sort of comfort food or fattier food or, uh, sorry, uh, starchier food um, because your body thinks you need energy because you're so tired. And so, um, you know, there have been a number of studies lately that have linked sleep loss with um, obesity and, and really call them sort of chronic um, interconnecting epidemics in society now where people aren't getting enough sleep, and then this is sort of, you know, perpetuating their need to eat, you know, food that's not so good for you and, and uh, be too tired to exercise and these sorts of things. And so, um, so that, that's the one that's been the most studied. Great, thank you. It looks like we've run out of time for questions. It's, um, I want to remind everyone that this um, talk has been recorded and will be uploaded to our website this afternoon. So please feel free to share. Um, and thank you again, um, Dr. McClum, for sharing your insights, your research, et cetera, with us today. Very much appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.